Awesome. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started um, just for the sake of timing. So again, if you are here um, and you are coming on for a webinar that we're talking about tech enabled executive search, you're in the right place. Um, just to reiterate real fast, because I know a few people have joined since the last time I made this announcement, uh, we are recording. That recording will be shared with you today after the webinar, so you don't have to worry about taking notes. Um, if you have questions, please drop them in chat or Q&A as we go. Uh, we do have time reserved at the end to answer those questions, so feel free to drop them in as you think of them, or if you want to wait till the end, that's fine too. I'm super, super excited because we've got Christian Spletzer. I said it right this time, Spletzer. I keep trying to say say Speltzer too for some reason, but Spletzer, um, the founder and CEO of Clockwork. And we have Stephen Liu from Interseller, who's also co-founder and CEO. So first and foremost, Christian, I just want to kick it over to you just to give a quick intro about yourself and Clockwork. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. As Christina said, I'm the founder and CEO of Clockwork. Um, we are a software solution specifically designed for the executive recruiting industry. I did some time in executive recruiting back in the days of at CT Partners uh, when it was first Christian Timbers and then went up to CT Partners and scaled from 50 to 500 people worldwide. Um, I was in the tech practice. I came from tech. I have a small stint in, in the legal industry as well. Um, but very quickly as the company started to scale, um, I got more and more involved with operations and saw a need and here we are. Cool. Awesome, Steven. Hey everyone, I'm Steve. Uh, I am the CEO and founder of Interseller. Uh, we help recruiters uh, with basically the research and outreach part of like the executive search or internal too. Uh, but today we'll talk a little bit more on the external side. But uh, yeah, my background is mainly in software engineering. Uh, I look young, but I've been doing engineering now for God knows how long, 15 or so years since I was like 13. Uh, actually started my own company when I was 14. Ever since then, uh, I've had a, a kind of like knack to like build companies uh, and also just kind of like build, eventually build a company that I work with everyone that I, that I love to work with. And uh, yeah. Uh, back in when I was, uh, I used to work for Compass, the big real estate uh, uh, like firm that just went IPO recently. It was the first five engineers there uh, and also worked at several other small stage startups and just kind of like knew the pain of just kind of like hiring, finding people, convincing people to join the company. So my background's a little less in the executive search firm space, but more on the internal hiring manager side of, of engineering. Awesome. Uh, and I am Christina. I lead growth marketing at Interseller, and I'm going to be moderating today. So before we get into kind of the, the questions and conversation here, I just want to kind of lay the stage. Um, some of the things that we're going to try to hit on, and I know Christian and Steve will do a good job of this, is, you know, things like what parts of the recruiting process can and should be tech enabled, how to use tech to empower your process, not replace it. Um, and give some examples of some executive search firms using tech efficiently. Um, and so that's what we're really going to try to hit on. But again, if you have other questions outside of what we're discussing or that go along with what we're discussing, drop those in chat or Q&A. Uh, so Krishna, I'm going to kick off with you first here. Um, from your perspective, I'm curious, what you know, what does the executive search um, and tech landscape look like right now from, from your point of view? And, and what are you hearing from both non-customers and customers? Yeah, so, you know, talking to our customers, um, technology is always a fundamental concern. You know, their business is um, about pleasing their clients and uh, winning new work and technology they recognize is gonna help them do that. Um, and technology shifts over time in terms of what is the most important thing uh, that an executive search firm is focused on. Right now, um, we're hearing a lot about integrations, a lot about APIs. Um, we're, we're hearing from our customers uh, a real desire to become more efficient on some of the more labor-intensive tasks 
like scheduling or interviewing? Um, or how do you make sure that your clients are reading what you send them, um, getting in touch with candidates? So all of these things, which are you know, fundamentally covered within the process of executive search and with recruiting in general, um, are coming up in various ways from both customers and non-customers. Like, how do we improve? How do we become more efficient and more effective along this, this process timeline? Um, you know, one, one thing that I do notice along the way, and we've been doing this for a while, um, that technology, and you, you said it, it enables this process. Um, sometimes people get very focused on the one thing, thinking that, you know, it's going to solve the problem and getting very somewhat tunnel vision around um, that particular thing, whether it's, you know, calendaring. Um, calendaring is definitely going to help you do your job better. Um, I used to, when I used to recruit, would uh, say that, you know, it would take me about 50% of my time would be scheduling because it's, it's, a, it's a bear. So um, figuring out how to use technology to solve those problems is definitely going to make our customers and non-customers more effective in their job. But um, overall, just staying focused on that process from how do you find the work? How do you win the work? How do you run that project effectively? And then how do you use projects that you've done in the past to, to start that process over again of finding and winning more work? And technology is going to support each and every one of those steps. And you know, at Clockwork, we're, we're always looking for ways that we can build better technology to support that. And also, obviously, find partners that can do it as well. Cool. Yeah. One of the like, right? What Christian said. Uh, one of the biggest key questions that we always get in our sales process is pretty much like integrations, right? Like, what do you? Who do you? Who do you work with? Uh, is A part A? And do you work with like the ATS that I use? Um, I find that most of our customers who come and join Interseller know their process already, right? Um, they already have kind of a process like that's pretty manual uh, where it goes from like step one, step two, step three. Uh, and they have like a lot of different pieces of technology at every single phase of essentially what they are doing. Um, so over kind of like the period and just also one of the reasons why we built Interseller 2 was to actually consolidate some of those processes that that makes sense to just put into one package instead. So that way, for example, it is as easy as of a click of a button rather than copying and pasting things from one place to another and copying another thing to another place just to get, you know, data into your ATS or figuring out someone's email address or getting an email sent. Um, we find that like a lot of our customers come and levitate a little bit more towards technology to not really solve like a like a AI problem or something that is like, I need something that can just do things for me. They come to us to figure out, I got this process. Can you help me like add compliance to it? Add syncing to it can i can you help me like shorten the time this process takes right now and make it into a much shorter like five minute process while still while reducing the errors that like our recruiters make so um, a lot of the times that's uh our whole purpose here at interseller is pretty much to help kind of like like build that process for for recruiters or sorry not build but really just kind of like help like enable that process for for our customers. Yeah, I heard some good things from both of you. Um, I think one thing, Christian, that you kind of hit on was around like, all right, let's help make this process process efficient, but then let the repeatability factor, because you're going to have to continue to do it, right? So making something repeatable and scalable. And Steve, you said some great things too about, you know, using tech to enable, not replace a process um, and really workflow optimization at the end of the day. Love that. Yeah. Um, just want to ch chime in on that, just on that point about AI, Stephen. The, that is one I hear a lot, uh, or not a lot. It's actually, it's died down a bit. Um, but uh, for the last 10 years, that's come up you know, from time to time. Um, and both in the let's get AI because it's going to fix everything to don't let AI replace us, um, please. And it's that is one of those ones where 
there's a focus on it. And the reality is that, you know, AI will probably play um, in recruiting at some point. Um, we've actually done a lot of research on AI. We've talked to a lot of providers. Uh, it takes a lot to teach an AI or a machine how to think about recruiting. Um, and I was, I had one client ask for it and we talked to a, a provider and he said, yeah, I can install it. No problem. But who's going to spend the 10,000 hours of teaching what a title for a particular role is a good match. And so there's still a lot of human interaction needs to get. And that's just one aspect of that process, right? You can surface people faster. Sure. But then who's going to talk to them? Who's going to suss out if they're a good fit? Who's going to talk to the client? You know, I don't see AI replacing recruiters anytime soon. I don't, I can't say ever, but you know, anytime soon. Yeah. I have a famous phrase for AI, which is like, can you teach your five-year-old kid to do essentially recruiting for you? Uh, you can, you can teach them very, very straightforward processes like, Hey, take this and put it here. Right. But it can't make those like inference decisions. Like, all right, is this CEO like, like part of a tech company that's like that I'm trying to like hire for. Right. So I, I will say that like eventually maybe down the road, but like, in my opinion, it's more like 10, 20 years out. So we're all, yeah, we're all still good for a while. There's job security for a while, guys. We're, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> I saw, I saw Steve's eyes light up as soon as uh, you started to talk about AI. Cause it's like a topic. Of, <laughs> yeah. There's we, get a lot. Too. we get it a lot also. We do. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Christian, throwing it back over to you here, uh, you know, not to drum in COVID, but it's still there, right? This past year has looked and felt very different for many recruiting teams and, you know, executive search firms who have had to shift strategy, right? Completely yeah. for engaging new clients and candidates. How have you seen them adapt on your side? Well, I mean, just kind of, it's a Zoom world, you know? Um, I... I, yeah, we, we utilize Zoom technology and Hangouts before, but this is, this is very different. I think everybody and those who are reluctant to do it are doing it now. I, I don't know. I don't hear of people um, doing conference calls um, these days. So, uh, you know, this getting incorporated has forced this, the adoption of this technology. This technology has been around for a long time. Um, and whether it's interviewing candidates, talking to clients, um, talking to prospects, everybody, not just recruiting industry, but everybody has really uh, integrated this into their lives. Um, in terms of, you know, collaboration with clients, with prospects, with your team, you don't get the ability to get up, walk 50 feet into the next office and have that sort of mind meld. Um, and for recruiting, that that was very um, that was very important when I worked with partners or other recruiters who were a little bit more uh, touchy feely around the process or you know I'll know it when I see it. Um, that worked if we were in physical proximity. However, you know now that we're not, um, you know I've, I I have heard that it's been a little bit of a period of adjustment for those that have operated that way. Um, We've always believed in online collaboration. Obviously, our whole platform is kind of built on that, whether it's online collaboration on projects within your own team or with your clients and capturing information that would be shared, you know, on a drive by office conversation or sitting at the boardroom talking to your client, capturing that online in the project, making sure people can refer back to it and, and using that so that you are managing the project in, in a really effective way um, rather than sort of, you know, spinning plates. There was a lot of spinning plates. I don't know, you know, this was my experience, like eight projects were running at a time and you're running between them. And it was only because we weren't taking the extra 30 seconds to document this stuff. And so with Clockwork, you do that, you share that information with the team, then you share it with your client and it just cuts down on a lot of that, you know, what can be chaos if it's, if it's becomes overwhelming. So, um, you know, we've seen we've seen a lot of our users actually tracking some of the sort of feature adoption. A lot more of that process management piece is getting a lot more utilization, which is which is great to see. Cool. Yeah, 
I think uh, Christian kind of like nailed it there, which is like, again, typical office scene where you are shoulder to shoulder with somebody else. We're able to provide feedback pretty much immediately, right? We are able to ask a colleague a question if like we have one pretty, pretty instantaneously, right? And so technology now kind of like needs to replace that kind of like facility where we are able to speak to one another in an office, right? Uh, for example, like Slack helps enable communication, right? Uh, Clockwork, for example, helps enable like collaboration and uh, documentation on, on processes, right? Uh, for us, like enablement and automation now becomes key too in, in that process because like you, for example, like how do I share like uh, some copy over to another uh, colleague of mine or how do I show my manager, for example, how well I am doing across the board, right? It's all about kind of like now trying to replace something that used to be in person and now that is out of, per like that now more mainly remote. And, uh, I do believe that uh, more and more companies, for example, are choosing to become remote because it is kind of like better for for employees to kind of like really save some time from, I remember Christian telling me he was like saving an hour and a half from commuting, right? Um, and then for, for me, for example, I saved somewhere, I, I always tried to find a place that like was less than 10 minutes away from our office, but, um, now we don't need an office and uh, now we're a fully remote team. But um, in terms of just kind of like how I've seen it as, as a company standpoint, uh, I think everyone felt it really badly in 2020, right? Like in the beginning of April, uh, you know, uh, March, April, May, not so great months. Uh, then things started picking up. People started seeing kind of like more uplift from uh, starting in June and July and we, in fact, in terms of like the number of customers looking for automation software or trying to find a better ATS solution, uh, almost doubled for us pretty much like overnight in June and things started like picking up fast for, for us. Um, yeah, that's kind of how I've seen it uh, kind of evolve over the past year. Yeah, and I would actually agree with that too, just because I've worked pretty closely with some of our customers and, you know, it, it's interesting. I think, Christian, you kind of talked about this too. Maybe it was before we hopped on here live, but, um, you know, there was that period where people just kind of put the brakes on almost everything. And then people were like, well, quite frankly, crap, I've got to start doing more business development, right? And trying to figure out how to drum up more clients. And so we saw a lot of that, especially last year with people just trying to, make up for losses or paused clients. Um, and I would say probably over the last like five, six months, more and more, you know, external firms have started, you know, uh, doing both sides of the business again, much more efficiently and a little bit more full circle to what they were doing pre, you know, pre COVID. So, yeah. yeah. When everyone went to lockdown, uh, the, I mean, the world just froze, but executive, the industry just froze, right? Projects stopped. The ongoing projects were put on hold and projects that were, you know, that a lot of our customers were hoping would start, uh, didn't. And for about a quarter, it was crickets. And um, it started to come back in August. We had a lot of customers say that they were starting to see it come back. Uh, and those that used that time to map out their business development approach and to start curating lists. I mean, executive search, you know, just like anything, it's like, you know, feast or famine. There is that kind of, we're busy. I don't have time for business development. I, you know, I know I got to put way more effort into it and, and then the projects kind of dry up and then there's this kind of the shifting of priorities. Um, a lot of our customers got into that and started projects, marketing projects, not executive search projects, marketing projects of people they knew people that they would find uh, were relevant to previous projects they did that they could talk to, um, to start mapping out doing a lot of the research and a lot of the outreach. Um, and those that did reported that they got, a, you know, they, they started to see the benefits of this as we started to acclimate to our current environment. Ahead of the game, ahead of the game. <laughs> Absolutely. I, yeah, totally on par there. Um, all right. So let's, let's talk a little bit about why 
because I think there's there is some hesitation and we've kind of talked about this um, around executive search firms kind of bringing tech into their process and strategy. And I've seen this in my own conversation sometimes um, with just kind of that behavior shift or, or being open to it, right? So I'm curious why you think that is. And I'm okay, whoever wants to start here, Christian, maybe maybe you wanna start, start this one too. Sure. Yeah, it is, um, there is a bell curve distribution of those that are just Die hard, bleeding edge technology adopters, and those who are no. Um, and most of us are in, in the middle. Uh, I, I think that, and rightly so, there is a perception that executive search uh, requires a sort of white glove approach. And that requires a heavy interaction, personalized interaction, whether you are dealing with your clients, dealing with the candidates, or reaching out to those that are on your project as people you want to possibly recruit. Um, you know, fundamentally it is a sales pipeline. You know, it's a marketing and sales pipeline. You make a list, you reach out to them, you engage them, you see if they're open to discuss it, then you're doing a little buying and selling yourself. Um, and if you go too fast or if you are sloppy, um, you can sour the brand in the market. And when you're dealing with executive search, um, it's rarefied air. You're at the top of the pyramid, right? There are fewer people who can be a CEO of a company. There are a few people who could be an SVP or VP. Um, so you don't really, if you, especially if you're focused on a sector or a, a, a function, um, you don't have the opportunity to um, be sort of willy-nilly in your approach. Um, so I think a lot of the people that I talk to are reluctant to utilize some technology uh, for fear of making a mistake. You know, it's if you make one mistake with an email, well, you can backtrack off that. If you create a mass mailing list and you something, you know, you insert the, the, the wrong first name, um, that has greater effect or, or potential down down the line. So uh, there's fear, and that that you know that that was real some time ago. Um, however, the technology has gotten a lot better. And the people who can teach you on the technology are also really aware of these issues. So, um, you know, it's it's something that if you if you are afraid of making those changes, uh, you got to pick the right provider. You know, you can't just go out and um, you know, sort of trial and error. Uh, you got to make sure you're trained on it, so you don't you know make any kind of business mistakes. Um, but you also should, you know, it, it's a skill to hone and you should do it and you should test it and you should still take the time to utilize it correctly and appropriately for whatever project or, or area you're working in. But don't be afraid of it because it's, it is, it has really profound effects on shortening the days to placement or your placement rate because you, it just has greater opportunity to maximize your, your time. Yeah, I find that it's probably two parts where like Christians, where it's like the fear of, again, just failure in the sense, but hey, uh, no, no good company like fails zero times. So uh, <laughs> I've definitely, I've definitely have failed uh, a bunch of times during, during uh, trying to figure out product and related things for our customers. And so uh, and it is always, it's always a learning lesson. I think one of the key things that I have always abide to, uh, and everyone in my company knows this, which is like, it's actually like, if you make, uh, if you, you have two paths, right? You have a decision to either say, yes, let's do it or no. But if you are actually stuck in the middle doing absolutely nothing, you're actually doing a lot worse because you haven't made a decision on either yes or no, right? But if you, for example, made the wrong decision, at least you can course correct. And that's how I always kind of like always portray email too, which is again, which my, our hope at here is that like, you know, Christian mentioned email, which is like, let's say you email a hundred people and you accidentally put in the wrong name or you, or you put in some like weird variable that you forgot to like fill out or something like that. Everyone is a human in a sense. Cool. Like if someone points you out for your mistakes, uh, I think that's a pretty clear indicator that like you may not may or may not want to work with that person, for example, right? Or on the opposite side, which is like you get a person who's like 
hey, like, I know this is a mistake. Like, uh, you know, we're human. Everyone makes mistakes. It's totally fine. There's no such thing as kind of like the perfect pitch to like, like there's no magic bullet. There's no perfect pitch to like land a client or land a candidate 100% of the time. It's always about trial and error. And so one of the key things at Interstellar is that we always teach all of our customers to be like, try one copy out. Let's see how that performs with 100 people. If it's like really low, great, cool. We know this messaging doesn't work. Let's try a different like copy. Let's try something else for that industry. It's always an adaptation process. So even if you emailed like 100, 200 people, let's say you didn't get like the, the right responses or like the, the proper response rate, there's always a recovery path. You now have learned something to build a better copy and build on top of that. So I think some of the reluctancy comes with like, I need to build this perfect because I only have one shot, right? Like it's gotta be perfect uh, coming out the door because it's related to my brand. It's related to how I operate. Like, like the fear of like being like posted on LinkedIn and being like, look at this terrible email I got. That doesn't happen very often to, to say, but really I find that people like, uh, the reason why people don't adopt technology is because like, A, it's very, very new to them. Um, it is probably something they, that they're like really, that they've seen so many mistakes on the other end that they're like really reluctant to try something like new, like our technology. Um, the second one is just really, um, I, I, we tend to find this really more on the extremely tech heavy adoption side, which is like, it has to be perfect meaning that like every little bit of how this thing integrates how it sends out must be perfect to how i operate um we do see that that's kind of like one thing which is great it's like you're you're doing your research but um that's also another thing where like i i tend to find that like as as long as technology does kind of like the the base of what you need to accomplish all the other things kind of like fall on top of it. And there's always workarounds too that, uh, that, uh, that we help suggest to our customers. But those are, that's probably the main of reason. There's like the fear of it not performing well, but I, I, I like to say more as like the, like the, the FOMO way. It's like, you're missing out. You're missing out if you ain't trying it though. <laughs> so. Yeah, the, the, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Christian, please. I just said, I love, I love yeah. that. Yeah, the rigidity, you know, when, when you finally figure it out, when you have your process down, um, it's, it's hard to, to step back and go, okay, well, let's, let's continue to iterate. Let's innovate. Let's, let's improve. I mean, if you think you yeah, got it, it's like, uh, it, it takes a long time to kind of crack this nut. You know, there is, we wrote a whole uh, ebook on our website called the eight stages of executive recruiting, right? It's, it's kind of breaks it down into that framework. Um, and, you know, we, we chose eight other, you know, we've had prospects say, Oh, I have seven. So it's very different. It's, you know, it's the same, whether it's seven or nine or eight it's, um, and so figuring out how to incorporate new, whatever that new thing is into the process that has worked for you in the past is, is hard. You know, it definitely is hard, but, um, as the technology evolves and Stephen, you talked about, you know, mail analytics to be able to track your, the effectiveness of, of your outreach. I mean, that didn't exist before. Um, and to just throw something out and yeah, we, we, we all get those recruiting and sales emails that are just, they are worth posting on LinkedIn. I mean, if I were darker, I would, you know, I would post it every day because I get them. Right. Um, and then I also get the ones that are really good that someone took an extra 15 seconds to write. Now I know they're using mail, you know, outreach technology, um, but if someone actually is good at doing a little bit of research and can incorporate that in the outreach, I actually call those people because I know that they're actually taking the time to, to do it. And among the noise that I get, doing your company, you know, like, okay, which one is that? You know. Uh, versus somebody who's taking some time to kind of incorporate some of the information they've gleaned from uh, the research they've done. Uh, you know, it really can have, uh, again, the extra time up front pays off dividends if you, if you have the right technology and the right process and are willing to incorporate the two. 
Yeah, look, my the, there's two companies, uh, by the way, that reached out to me in the past two days with like really terrible mistakes, by the way, which is, by the way, Facebook and Amazon, who both reached out to me about a entry level software engineering position. So look, mistakes happen. <laughs> Those are definitely like weird moments where I'm like, uh, this guy definitely didn't do his research. but. Yeah, like what Christian said, put in put in just the extra effort and you will shine comparatively to Facebook and Amazon in yep. these cases. <laughs> Quality versus quantity any day of the week. Um, yeah. But anyway, awesome. All right, so let's talk about process in tech, right? Um, and uh, again, I'll start with you, Christian. What are some ways that executive search firms can utilize technology to empower their process? I know we've kind of talked about this a little bit, but yeah. you know, I'd love to know your thoughts. And, and second to that, what part of the process can and should be replaced or enhanced with tech, in your opinion? Yeah. So you know, as I mentioned, this this eight stages of of executive recruiting uh, is kind of how we build our software. We build our software to kind of address each of these eight stages. And just in short, it's finding work. You know, once you find the work, then you got to win the work. So that's kind of your marketing business development. Then you got to run the project. And the project is you got to set the strategy. You got to do the research. You got to do the outreach. Then you got to assess the talent present it to your client and get them to make a decision. And that's that big D It's like, you gotta get them to make a decision. Um, and that's, that's, that's kind of where you earn your money. Um, and once you do that, then you use that work to close that project and grow you know, you leverage your work, figure out what you learned, how do you approach other people? Um, and so, you know, we've built a software that addresses each of these stages and incorporate things within the product and then incorporate, you know, partnerships again, like with Interstellar. Um, the find work and the research and the outreach, those are great places that you can use, uh, you know, the, the research and outreach capabilities that you guys have, uh, research and outreach take a long time. They're come, you know, they, they take a long time and, um, you know, everyone's thinking about the placement, but if you don't have a good foundation, if your pipeline isn't good, and if you don't get to the right people quickly and get them into discussions and start doing that assessment piece, you, you don't progress. It's not, it is a progression. So you can't just skip over. Like maybe you know somebody that's looking for work and you can call them first, but the likelihood that they're gonna be fit for your next project is very, very low. So you have to build that pipeline based off of your strategy. Um, and you can cut down on your days of your project incredibly if you have a good strategy and then use that strategy to build research and then use that research to do the outreach and figure out like see what i'm saying how do you track the effectiveness of your outreach and similarly with the business development piece you know a a marketing list is similar to a search you got to research the right people because you don't want to just spam the market and say hey you know we do tech placements and you send that off to a manufacturing ceo that doesn't Find the right research, find the right audience, reach out to them, set a cadence, develop your strategy. And you know, we talked about that feast or famine stage. In that stage when you are you know, figuring out your business development, really map out the next three, six, 12 months. Set your template, your cadence, your, your outreach, automate it as much as possible because you're gonna be busy doing projects pretty soon. And if you don't have a strategy, stuff won't get done. So those, those three of the eight stages are really ripe for, for this type of technology specifically. Yeah, I'll speak to more of like the outreach side. Uh, I find that anything really, just to, to sum up really quick, which is like, I find that anything that is like human driven, uh, such as like, sometimes it's matchmaking, sometimes it's interviewing, anything that requires kind of that, face-to-face -face interaction with a candidate or a client doesn't need like should and should not be automated uh anything else that doesn't really require any human to human interaction can be pretty much automated right like knowing when to follow up knowing like doing tedious research right because tedious research tends to be very very similar every single time you do it um 
knowing like how to, how to reach out, knowing when to time things, right? Like if you've got good automation, I, I technically say like you can still run your company even when you're sick because the automation helps you kind of like push your objectives forward, right? With the right strategy and technology on top of it, you can push your strategy forward at any given time that you want, whether it be weekends, which I highly advise not working on the weekends, or if you're like sick, right? Things can still operate behind the scenes for you to wake up the next day to be like, oh, I've done these things already, right? Yeah, so like what Christian said, a good strategy sets the precedence for everything else. Awesome. Yeah, and, and preparing for the next step when you're doing what you're doing, right? That, that's kind of, you know, being proactive, thinking ahead, knowing the process, knowing the progression of the project does help you remember to set tasks to remind you to follow up on the person you called or does help you to set the stage for your clients and saying, this is what you should expect, right? So I said that big D at the end is like that, that piece, like you have to manage their expectations. That is a high touch white glove service that you're offering when you're doing an executive search that can't be automated. But in, you know, since you know the process and since you know how it goes and you know what to expect, you are able to communicate that effectively and set the, the parameters within the, you know, set the expectations of the client. And that's really what you get paid for is, is getting them to a point saying, look, you know, this is going to take a while. You're not going to get a placement within the first week. I know you're, I know you should have started this three months ago, but it's going to take some time. Um, and so, but just know that we're doing this to get you that placement and there are stages to do it. So, and knowing that, you know, setting, setting those concerns aside or at bay at least, you can go and then automate the in-between stages the, the, so that you can be more effective and work on other projects, right? Because that's, that's kind of what we're, the business we're in. It's like, you gotta maximize your time. Super smart. Yeah, you have to maximize that time. And some of the teams that we're working with are doing more or equal with less headcount too, which makes it even more challenging sometimes. So um, we do have, we've had a few questions come in about this. So I feel like maybe we should have moved this part of the conversation up a little bit, but I think we wanted to do this on purpose. But um, when we talk about clockwork and interstellar specifically, right? Um, I would love for each of you, if you could just talk a little bit about how, you know, your solution, your platform specifically um, empowers executive search or recruitment firms and how, how they can help, right? So what part of the process are you solving for Christian um, with clockwork and, and how does that kind of fit into uh, the broader recruitment process? Yeah. So we have a holistic approach to executive search business in general. It is a complete solution for executive recruiters, you know, who are running a search firm. Um, so we have the business development aspects. We have the marketing aspects. We, you know, primarily the, the attention goes on projects and managing projects internally with your team and managing with them with your clients, um, managing client uh, candidates. Uh, and then repeating that process over and over. Um, and so we are able to look at every aspect of the executive recruiting business, whether it's the one person shop or you know the biggest firms, biggest names in the industry um, who all use our product to kind of be their, their one-stop product. We have built uh, our API so that we can integrate with other providers of technology that our customers need to support their business. They, it is a platform that allows them to kind of custom tailor their, their approach using the, the technology integrations that we provide. So um, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the presentation, the pitching, the work going and saying, you know, prospective client log in here and I'm going to show you how we're going to work together. You know, this is going to be our research stage where we're going to show research. These are the candidates we're going to go approach. This is the job spec we're going to go to market with. And these are the research criteria we're going to screen people against when we talk to them. And once we've made them, you know, once we've assessed that they are at a level where you should meet with them, you're going to meet with them and you're going to have everything you need to know about that person before the interview, because it's all located in one place. And we've accumulated it throughout 
the, the life of this project. Their resume, yes. Their LinkedIn profile, yes. But the notes, there's things we've shared back and forth. Why we think you should meet with them will all be there on this project. And you can log in 24 seven. And the client knows where to go, knows what input they need to provide so that the recruiter is getting that feedback and then taking that information to get to that decision and find, you know, feeling, finding not only a good match, but someone that the client is really confident is going to be good for their company. And then at that point, you take all that information that has been entered into that project and lo and behold, it's in your database as well. And that's a huge thing that we, you know, we think differentiates us from our competitors, which is by focusing on projects, we're solving that data entry problem that exists across all the ATSs, right? Because people just kind of shove it into a filing cabinet, you know, as tax time comes up, we didn't think about that. Um, but with us, it's, it's organized within the context of a project. So you think about, ah, I did a CFO search two months ago. I have another pitch coming up for a CFO. Let me leverage that work. Let me see who I ran on those projects. Um, and so we, we, from top to bottom, from, from the, the time you got to go get your first search to leveraging all of your, your previous work to continue your, growing your business, we, we kind of touch on all of it. I love that. And it, it really does, again, speak to that repeatability and being able to tap back into, you know, things that you've already worked so hard to develop and in other searches, et cetera, projects. I know you call them projects, but I love that. Um, Steve, you want to speak a little bit to, to Interseller? And maybe yeah. I would love, I know we have a mixture of Interseller and Clockwork and non-Interseller and Clockwork customers on here. Um, I think it would be interesting to maybe speak just real quick how we work with Clockwork too. Yeah, and, and the integration. Yeah, I would love that. Cool. Yeah, I see. I recognize some names in the attendees, but uh, I'll go over kind of like really basic what Interstellar does and provides at like kind of the basic level. And also then second part is like how we integrate with Clockwork. So first things first, Interstellar, we help with the sourcing and business development uh, part for executive firms, right? And so um, in both of those parts, like Canada development and business development, there are some commonalities. You have to do your research, right? You have to go find, you, you found them on LinkedIn and now you go, what's next, right? Really the key thing is like, I need to know a little bit more about them so I can reach out to them. I need to know their contact information. Uh, I need to know maybe their phone number if I wanna give them a call. And I need to do that now in, in mass, right? And so the, the, the hardest part is that, you know, you are have a thousand tabs open trying to figure things out and trying to put things in different places, but we really just kind of consolidate all of the best aspects of it and provide it with one click of a button. So when you're on a LinkedIn profile and you're like, I want to reach out to this person, just press it and you can add them into what we call a sequence uh, and they will get a series of emails from uh, email one, email two, email three. You can also add in separate tasks to say like, I wanna do a LinkedIn connection. Maybe I wanna do a text message or a phone call. You can add in those specific tasks so that way you have kind of like a, like a strategy set for reaching out to that person individually. And then you can just add like, start really going in, in efficiency by saying like, let me add 30, let me add 40 and, and so forth. And so our integration with Clockwork is actually very, very cool and very swift, right? So the great part about, uh, or the worst part about, you know, just data in general is like, how do I get it from place A to place B, right? As Christian said, uh, his, like Clockwork is basically that central repository, that central database of like, let me figure out who I've reached out to and so forth, right? Uh, and Interseller is that part of like, okay, cool. I found all these people and I've reached out to them. Now, how do I get into Clockwork? Instead of like exporting a CSV file, we automatically just sync every single person that you add into Interseller straight into Clockwork. So we create all those records and entries uh, about either that contact or that d client development that you're doing or that candidate that you're reaching out to all of the activity that you've done with them, all the emails that you've sent get all synced over into Clockwork for you. So that way you don't actually have to do any of that yourself, right? We have a direct connection with your email account. So if they respond back, we sync that reply over to Clockwork. 
if like for example there are they have a resume we can sync that over to their photo etc all of that good information that you need to know about a person just automatically just gets pushed into there the nice part is you can actually set up sequences in such a way with clockwork projects so that way you're like okay cool this sequence is directly related to this project. So anytime you add them into that specific sequence, they'll get automatically synced over into to those specific projects too. So now they're one-on-one, -on -one, everything's really organized. And now I can just go browse LinkedIn, press like uh, one singular button on LinkedIn and I get everything that I mentioned, their contact information, uh, their automatic sequencing outreach. And number three, all that data is all synced over into Clockwork automatically with just one click of a button. And now you've taken like a really mundane process that was so many steps that I mentioned before. And now it's just really just all embedded into one. And that's kind of like what we provide as a solution. Uh, and that's also what our integration with Clockwork is. Awesome. Thank you so much for both of you for, for kind of chatting through these questions. We're now at the point where we can continue to take some audience questions. So um, please feel free again, uh, no pressure or anything, uh, to drop any questions you might have in the Q&A box or the chat box, and we can definitely get to those. Um, while we're kind of waiting for some more questions to roll in, I'm curious, I'm, I'm going to put you guys on the spot real fast and ask a question. I hope it's not, uh, not too, uh, crazy, but when we think about the future, right. And kind of the future of work and future of recruitment and process, I'm curious, do you have any predictions over the next, you know, I don't know, let's just say three to five years. I know that's crazy. That it's a heavy question, but I yeah, I've got a few. Spill the beans, Christian. Spill the beans. Yeah, no, I I, I think uh, I think people are on a spectrum in terms of their needs for human direct direct human interaction, and I think that we've all had a little bit of a test run on you know what we need. And I think people will go back to work. I also think that people realize that the. Uh, work doesn't stop when you work from home. So there's going to be a hybrid. You know, I, I think that we're already seeing this, um, as I mentioned before this, like uh, when we went to lockdown, we shut our offices down and I've been trying to sublease that thing for 14 months. Um, we just got our first bite and the market back in Oakland is actually starting to come back according to our real estate uh, agent. I think that's, I think we're going to see that. I think people are going to get back to work because people like being around people. Like you get a lot out of that beyond just, um, you know, work product. Um, and, but I also think that people realize, Hey, you know, we can trust you to work from home. And, and when you say you're working, you're working, we got that. Um, so I think there's going to be more flexibility. I think people are going to, um, have the ability to, I don't know, be LA if they need to, um, but, or work from, from other markets. And I think what you'll see is you'll see um, industries that are have been somewhat location specific will start bleeding out into other areas. And from the executive recruiting perspective, um, your geography, your research is gonna change. Where your clients are more are comfortable recruiting candidates from, is not going to be your, you know, your top five markets or whatever it is that what industry you're in. It's it's going to change, and I think people are going to be more open to that. And that just, I think, um, that benefits everybody. That kind of opens up the the supply a little bit, and I think people will benefit from that. Mm, and a wider talent pool as well. Yeah. We call it right. I mean, yeah. really, Steve. Uh, I. I believe in a hybrid approach. This is just more of my hopes and dreams more than anything. I think like we've seen both extremas now. We've seen the extreme of being in the office five days a week to being remote five days a week for an entire year, right? I think people now have a taste of both, which means now that like there is a decision to make essentially for these companies to either do we go back to what we did before or do we stay with what we have today? And I actually think it will be more like a hybrid approach. I think like companies will realize that like 
A, like, oh, this is just us New York in general. New York City real estate is expensive. And I think one of the key things is that like, for me to rent an office, I could hire three additional people to, to like basically uh, take many, many hats off my plate, right? Um, I think one of the key things is like, my hope is that offices turn into a more hybrid approach where it's like, cool, I do want to come into the office. I do want to interact with people. So maybe companies may have like, cool, let's, let's all come in on Thursdays or Fridays. But my hope is that real estate kind of eventually matches that a little bit. We're in the sense of like, cool, I can book, I can have kind of like an office space, but I don't have to pay God knows how much like or per square foot <laughs> per year on, on a space like that. So my hope is that, but eventually I think like companies will either have to make one decision or the other. We've seen it with Shopify, by the way, instant, just turn over into remote, which is phenomenal. Um, I think Interstellar is going to be mainly remote for the most part, and we're all going to hang out soon one day, but that's my hopes and dreams. Uh, I'm an engineer, so my, my best hours of work by the way is and please don't email me past this time uh, which is which is i start actually coding past 6 p.m so from 6 p.m to 9 p.m i'm actually writing code that's the best time i have available to myself but i i do just like just like uh christian mentioned i love interacting with people during the day so having an office would be very cool for me just in the sense of like being able to like chat with coworkers in between calls that i have Awesome. We do have one question that I want to kind of end us on because I think it's a, a little bit of a heavier question, might need some thought. And I also just want to side note, remote life forever here. Um, <laughs> I operate primarily in the stages that need automation and technology, but our leaders don't understand the benefits available to them and just want the result. What's the best way to demonstrate what's possible and how it could impact the business? So what what's your advice when someone needs to make an internal business case but they're not getting buy-in results maybe uh i like uh, like if you work with a really good software company um in the in especially the sales stage one of the key things is uh like for example us as an at interseller which is like we get it we we see it a lot too like a lot of that reluctancy um, what we do is like we just say like hey why don't we just like bring you on board? Let's try it out for two to three weeks. And then let's show your, let's show your, show your management. Like, Hey, this is the results that you're getting, right? Like I'm able to reach out to three times as many more candidates, right. Um, than, than the rest. Right. So it's, it's, it's really one of the key things is like you yourself can try out software too. It's not that the company has to try out software. Uh, but that is definitely the, uh, maybe that might be the, the approach of like, try it and ask for forgiveness later, but that's, that's just my approach. But, uh, maybe Christian has like a better way to, uh, <laughs> to... Yeah, I, don't, I don't know if it's better. Um, but just something to think about. Um, it is a repeatable process where, wherever you fit, whether you're the, the admin, the researcher, the recruiter, the partner. It tends to be the sort of the vertical professional services model. And in need of automation, whether you're a researcher or a recruiter, or maybe you're doing both, um, making the business case to the decision maker, who I presume is a partner at the firm. Um, how many hours a week are you spending doing things that you think you could benefit from with automation? And if you map it out, if you're doing 20 hours of research or 20 hours of outreach and you think that you can have a significant impact on those numbers, um, you know, uh, careful what you wish for. You might, you might get, end up getting more work, um, but you might also get some more sanity, right? Because the business of search is incredibly stressful. I talked about the spinning plates piece. You are just running around from one project to another because you're behind because you are not utilizing things like automation or a sound process where you're kind of a repeatable process and figuring it out. So think about what your process is now. Think about the hours you spend doing that those particular tasks, and then try to try to think what other technology can do to reduce those hours. I mean, if you reduce the time you spend twenty percent, 
Like that's a lot. That's a significant portion uh, of your time that you get back. And, you know, you can think you can, you have more time to, um, to hone your skills, be more professional, take extra time to meet with candidates and clients or add to your workload, you know, all of which are pretty compelling reasons for your, for the partners who are running the practice. Yeah. One other thing, one other key thing too, that I liked mentioning is just more like you get kind of like a sense of where your partners are at too, right? Like if you tell them the business case and, you know, you do the math for them and they say like, no, we can go hire someone else to do it. Uh, you get, you kind of get like a sense of like where, where maybe that executive search firm is going. But uh, one other thing that I like, I like to like to note is um, that uh, <laughs> it's very expensive to hire and it it's very timely too, right? Like if I try to bring on another person to, let's say like there's a bit of my process that is just like I have to do over and over again to like put someone in there and train them uh, takes what three months to onboard and like there's all this other relative cost to it. Whereas like if I can solve that through software, that is definitely you know, like your costs are very low and the results are pretty immediate because you're not, again, you're not replacing your process. You're just augmenting one. Right. And, and you know, along those lines too, I mean, the, the fees in executive search are very high. The investment into software in executive search, the cost is very low relative to even just one search fee. So, um, you know, it, 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 but what is not high or the challenge in that equation is like, you have to show the value, not the cost, the value, because often when partners are sitting there running, I'm client facing, I'm out talking to candidates. I don't have time for this back end stuff that I don't deal with. And one of the things about clockwork is like partners deal with clockwork. Partners, are, partners and clients are logging into the, the project to see the process they value the, the process and the software as a result. But for partners who are not, um, who are you know relying on the old, hey, let's take a Word doc and convert it to PDF and then attach it to an email. Um, maybe they don't understand that automation of the re research and outreach process is going to yield the ability to do more work. Even if you say like, I'm gonna be able to add, like we're gonna free up some time to add one more search a year. That pays off itself by probably a factor of 80. Right? So, it's a, uh, it's something worth kind of putting numbers down on paper. Awesome. Well, listen, um, we are literally closing up on time. Um, if any questions come up after this, please, please feel free to, you know, reach out to us. I'd like to think that Steve and Christian are both approachable. We're all on LinkedIn. So feel free to connect. Um, I'm going to be sending the recording out today. Uh, I will also send some resources. Christian, I, I want to share the the ebook that you guys have. Maybe I don't know. We'll have to we'll have to ask Scott sure, if you want to do that from your end. But um, I think that could be a, something powerful as a resource to share with people. But just want to thank our speakers, Steve, Christian. Thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day to come and speak. Um, and thank you to all the attendees. So everyone have a wonderful rest of your day, night, wherever you might be.